Hello, America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to Nature and the Nation. This podcast uses the format of a book review to explore the intersection of philosophical naturalism with paleoconservatism within the framework of the revitalization of the Republican Party. We will be exploring politics, philosophy, psychology, history, and sociology through a wide variety of books published both recently and historically. Thank you for tuning in. So for today's episode, we will be looking at what is conservatism? And this is a collection of essays edited by Frank Meyer. It was published in 1964. So many of the folks who have written for this are really some of the founders of the modern conservative movement. Um, Conservatism as we understand it today was largely created and defined by these individuals. Uh, I talked about this a little bit in In Defense of Freedom by Frank Meyer, where he, he introduces the premise of fusionism, which was the merging of the libertarian school of thought with the traditionalist school of thought. Uh, they sort of combined their their efforts into a united front against global communism because both the traditionalists and the libertarians uh, were fundamentally opposed to communism and socialism. And so they found common cause and ultimately built a philosophy that combined elements of both of those traditions, uh, the traditionalism and the libertarianism, or as it was originally called, uh, individualism sort of eventually became more known as as libertarianism. Uh, but it was the basic premise of freedom uh, on the side of the libertarians, a, a real dedication to economic and personal freedom, and then a dedication to tradition and virtue on the side of the traditionalists. And so this book here includes two essays that were written by uh, Frank Meyer, one of them in the beginning of the book and one of them at the end. And the essay at the beginning is actually uh, included. It's called Freedom, Tradition, Conservatism. That essay was included in the book that I reviewed, In Defense of Freedom. Um, originally, In Defense of Freedom was its own book, but the version that I reviewed had a couple other essays added to it. Uh, and one of them was this. So I'm not going to cover that. I believe I quoted a section of that back when I re back when I reviewed In Defense of Freedom. Um, and then there's he has another essay at the end of this when he kind of brings his thoughts together and he ha makes some comment on the other essays in the book. And I do want to read a portion of that essay. Uh, and I want to read a bit from three other essays. So a total of four essays in this I'm going to cover. There are 13 essays in the book. The other nine I'm not going to deal with. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the essays that deal a little bit more with the traditionalism side of things, a little bit less concerned with the libertarian side of things. Uh, I think that this is pertinent for me to review at this time uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, n number one, there's a bit of a movement afoot in conservatism to uh, kind of push out some of the more libertarian ideas um, and focus a bit more on the traditionalist side. And I think that it, to some extent, this comes from the, the movement toward nationalism within conservatism, because nationalism in in a way is opposed to libertarianism uh, because obviously nationalism focuses more on the nation state and the nation as a whole, whereas libertarianism is really focused on the sovereignty of the individual and really skeptical of collectives such as the nation. And so the nationalist movement in conservatism is pushing out, trying to push out some of that libertarian influence, but it's certainly not gone it's 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 embedded in much of the rank and file conservative thinking um and so i think that this kind of discussion of libertarianism and, and libertarian really is is fundamental to 
what we understand as conservatism. And this book talks about that a little bit. But um, the other thing that I want to bring attention to is uh, some things that have been bothering me lately in observing how the average conservative uh, is reacting in particular to uh, the COVID-19 crisis. I didn't really want to talk about COVID-19. I don't, I try not to talk a lot about current events on this podcast. I'm more interested in these books uh, and what they have to say on a more fundamental philosophical level versus getting into the nitty gritty of, of current events. Uh, but I can't help but feel disappointed in the response that I've seen as far as uh, it seems as though nowadays people define conservatism as adherence to a vast array of conspiracy theories. And the more outlandish the conspiracy theories one adheres to, the more conservative one is. And that just seems like the most absurd thing that I've ever heard. Um, and it comes down to uh, the, the idea of this vast left-wing conspiracy um, that infuses every component of current events, every activity of every, everything that the media says and does, everything every institution says and does just becomes part of this huge conspiracy. And it's it's kind of absurd. Uh, William Buckley has a article, has an essay in here when he talks about uh, some of the components that he has found to be insufficient for conservatism, and that he, as editor of National Review, sort of pushed away. And one of those things he talks about is the John Birch Society, and the John Birch Society was an anti-communist organization from back in the 1950s, 1960s, and they had. Uh, the leader of this group had put out this uh, like 300-page manifesto, and in it explains the the massive communist conspiracy at all levels of our government, and even uh, went so far as to essentially accuse President Eisenhower of being a communist, a secret communist agent. And this is General Eisenhower you're talking about, like one of the men responsible for victory in World War II. And to just make these claims that Eisenhower must be a communist agent, at some point it just reached the level of ridiculousness. And so Buckley and National Review pushed back and said, you know, this at some point, like they're all in on the anti-communism, but at some point it just goes too far and it becomes absurd and ridiculous and winds up dragging down the conservative movement with these, these theories. And I think that the same thing becomes applicable today when people don't really even understand like the fundamentals of what conservatism is. And, uh, and so that was kind of why I wanted to look at this book because nowhere in this book does it talk about how important it is to adhere to insane conspiracy theories that has no bearing on being a conservative. And it's entirely possible to thoroughly reject some of the more outlandish conspiracy theories. So, I want to look at this in the sense of, okay, so if conservatism is a philosophy that respects tradition, then it would make sense to look at the tradition of conservatism, to look back on earlier works. This is over 50 years ago, what those men back then claimed conservatism to be. Now, is it necessarily completely 100% applicable to today? No, because they were facing different circumstances. They were facing global communism. They were facing the Soviet Union uh, and the Soviet Union's expansive policies. And so their conservatism took on a particular hue. It took on a particular quality because it was specifically opposed to global communism. We don't face the same scenario today. We don't face the Soviet Union or global communism. And so the modern conservatism is going to look different as it faces different priority, has different priorities and faces different crises. So um, I want to start with looking at 
the la- the one of the last essays, uh, the second to last essay, they the version of this book I have is a newer version. They they added on a new essay. Uh, but what was the what was the last essay in the original version was Frank Meyer's closing essay. Like all of my episodes, I'm going to read some parts of this essay and then comment on them. Um, that's you know I don't do maybe the typical book review, but I want to I want to get into the granular details of what he says in this essay specifically and comment on that. And he's talking about basically he's talking about okay now that we have seen all the essays in this book, what can we gather? Conservatism is, and he he makes six points, and I'm going to hit all six of these points and provide some brief comments on them. Um, so to start with, he says, point one, he says, quote, however varied their religious commitments, the contributors all accept implicitly or explicitly the existence of an objective moral order based on what Eric Vogelin has called the constitution of being, that is the existence of immutable standards by which human conduct should be judged. This conservative acceptance of hard truths embedded in reality clashes directly with the liberal dependence upon the instrumental as the foundation and justification of political theory and practice. The liberal's faith is in democracy, the rightness of whatever is desired by 50% of the population plus one, or in progress the rightness of the direction in which events have been and are moving, and therefore the rightness of whoever has the power to move them, or in enlightened up-to-date experts, the rightness of the intellectual fashions of the age, or in a combination of all three. End quote. Okay, so that's his point number one, is this, uh, this acceptance of the existence of an objective moral order. So I want to comment a little bit on this. I think that the understanding of what liberalism is is not the same today as it was when this was written. And a lot of the books that I look at from this era, from like the mid-20th century, they focus on this idea of relativism, of moral relativism. But if you really look at the progressive or the liberal position on morals, it's not actually relativist. And I think this is a very outdated argument and really doesn't hold any weight nowadays because the modern liberal, the modern progressive has a very distinct idea of what is morally correct, right? So they have certain causes that they um, advance, certain moral causes that they find to be, that they, that they believe that they have found a moral truth that they then attempt to use uh, the state and society and civil society to implement this moral code. So, for example, you've got a crusade against racism. You've got a crusade against sexism and other forms of bigotry and intolerance. That becomes a primary moral code of the modern-day liberal, the modern-day progressive. And so that's not a relativist system. It's not relativistic. And so the argument against relativism is really outdated, and I'm not certain how accurate it was back in 1964. Obviously, I wasn't around in 1964 to like, you know, see what, what things were like, but it's not as applicable today. Um, so today the, it, there, there is sort of a clash between moral systems. And I've talked a little bit about what the conservative moral system looks like and what the liberal moral system looks like. And this book will address that as well, but it doesn't take the shape. I don't believe of, of objective morality versus relative morality. And furthermore, my own understanding of morality um, is not that there is an objective moral order outside of humans, but that our, there is an objective moral system, but it's vague. It's not concrete, and it's hardwired into our brains genetically through the process of evolution. So we have morals because we've acquired them because they worked for our ancestors, And so if there were no humans on this planet, there would be no moral system, right? It's not, it's not a moral system external to us. Now that's my, that's my belief. Now, does that mean that I 
can't be a conservative or that I shouldn't be a conservative because I believe that? Does that that puts me in conflict to some extent with what he's saying here about what conservatism is? And there are other things that that I come into conflict with personally. So, you know, obviously there's areas of divergence, and some of the articles, uh, some of the essays in this book conflict with one another on some points. What are the boundaries by which one can conflict with, like, conservative thinkers or generally accepted conservative ideas before one is no longer really a conservative at all anymore? Um, that's obviously an important question because there's so much dispute and there's so much that I begin to find unpleasant or unpalatable in a lot of modern conservative talk, right? So that's kind of an open question, and that's one reason that I sometimes start shying away from using the term. So let me move on to the second point. So for point number two, uh, he says, quote, For all of the contributors, the human person is the necessary center of political and social thought. Whether their stress is upon his freedom and his rights, or upon his responsibilities and his duties. It is in terms of the individual person that they think and write. They affirm the primacy of the person in contradistinction to contemporary liberalism, which is essentially concerned with collectives, the people, minorities, new nations, instrumentalities for the submergence and manipulation of the persons who make them up. Whether conservatives conceive the fulfillment of the person primarily in terms of individual autonomy or in terms of community, they reject the ideological concept of collective entities. Those to whom community is the predominant concept think not in terms of collectivities, but in terms of a rich interpenetration of personal relationships, based upon tradition and confirmed by living generations. End quote. So that's point two about individualism. Now, arguments have been made um, by Patrick Deneen, Yoram Hazoni, and others uh, that the focus on individualism is actually not a good basis for conservative thought, that the, that the, the hyper-focus on individualism turns us into alienated, atomized individuals with out adequate community bonds. Um, and I think that in some sense, this was, like I said, this was during an era of a conflict with communism. And because communism is so collectivist in its approach to human life, that, that the conservatives pushed in the other direction, and particularly like with the libertarian influence, pushed in the opposite direction to really elevate the individual as sovereign. Uh, I think myself, and I also think that that there's a general direction in, in much of conservatism to start stepping away from the like real focus on the individual at all costs because of all of the all the factors that sort of negate that. And I talked about this in some other episodes. I don't want to get into a tremendous amount of detail, but essentially the fact that you're born with obligations to your family and to your society, to your community, that you you didn't you didn't voluntarily accept these obligations. You're born with these obligations. And so in some sense, you are inherently, every individual is inherently subjugated to the larger community of which they're a part. And that's not something that they agree to. It's just the nature of reality. So there are all these different levels from the individual to the greater community to voluntary organizations up to the level of the state with its monopoly on coercive force and all, you know, and everywhere in between. And, and the focus exclusively on the individual versus the state that comes to be predominant in conservative conversation, uh, it serves to neglect the, all the intermediary institutions that serve such an important role in people's lives. And so, I think that there's got to be more of a focus on civil society and a step away from the laser-like focus on the sovereignty of the individual. And that's, you know, that's certainly there are some components of this book that I'm going to folk I'm going to, I'm going to read from that are not quite as hyper-individualistic as 
uh, as some of the more libertarian arguments, and I think maybe a, as Frank Meyer himself may be. So let me move to point three. He says, quote, or in regards to the individualism, he says, quote, this is seen most clearly in the contrast between the conservative and the liberal attitudes towards the state. While there is great divergence among conservatives as to the degree to which the state must be limited, they all share, in contrast to contemporary liberals, a distaste for the use of the power of the state to enforce ideological patterns upon human beings, however much they may differ on the modes by which and the extent to which the power of the state should be limited, they are in full agreement that it is but one institution among many, and that when its role is aggrandized in the fashion of the 20th century, it becomes dangerous beyond measure. End quote. Uh, so, you know, that, I think that one is still pretty much adhered to by most conservatives, that, that there must be some specific limitations on the power of the state. Um, and that the mechanisms by which one branch of the government is in conflict with another or the federal government in conflict with the states, by setting these components of the state against one another, it prevents any part of the state from gaining too much power. That there's a perpetual concern about the rise of an, an omnipotent state or a tyrannical state. Uh, point number four, he says, quote, the planning of human life, so characteristic of the liberal ethos, is anathema to every one of these contributors. That instrumental outlook in which human beings are conceived as faceless units to be organized and directed in accordance with the blueprints of the social engineer can be held only when men ignore the separate integrity of each human person as a focus of value and the existence of immutable moral laws not susceptible to ideological reconstruction. Whether the concentration of conservatives is on the importance of the free enterprise economic system and the strict limitation of the state as guarantee of the freedom of persons from the plans of the social engineer, or on the living multiplicity of the community arising from the rich tradition of civilization, the libertarian and the traditionalist emphases within conservatism alike reject the centralized power and direction necessary to the planning of society." End quote. So that's also something that I think is still every bit as relevant. The idea that uh, society can be planned from the top down by ideological um, agitators or, or, or activists believing society should look like this or believing society should look like that and then imposing these, these ideas from the top down. And that's essentially an argument against enforced ideology more than anything else. You know, an ideology says this is the most important thing. This is the way society is supposed to look conceived, uh, rationalistically, and then imposed from the top down. And conservatism should have an opposition to that. It should be fundamentally anti-ideological and against the imposition of visions of society from the top down. So the planning of human society rather than the organic flourishing of human society according to the free activity of its members. Uh, point five being, quote, the spirit of the Constitution of the United States as originally conceived pervades these pages. The limitation of government to its proper functions within government, tension and balance between local and central power within the federal government, tension and balance between the coordinate branches as opposed to the liberal disdain for the rights of the states before the federal government and the liberal apotheosis of the executive within the federal government. Conservatives, irrespective of whether their emphasis is upon tradition and order or upon liberty, unite in their veneration of the ordered liberty conceived and executed by the framers of the Constitution. End quote. So again, that point is still very important in modern conservatism and adherence to the Constitution of the United States. And... Um, I think it's just important to kind of throw out there as an idea that the Constitution, of course, when it was conceived, drew upon existing traditions, but also drew much upon Enlightenment thought that was fairly new at the time. So there's a sort of a European conservatism, especially older European conservatism, that looks back more toward a, a, a previous set of ideals 
uh, before those ideals that came to embody or came to guide the United States Constitution, more of a throne and altar uh, sort of conservatism that was more friendly to aristocracy and monarchy than, say, the American conservative is. And I think that's an interesting avenue of conservative thought that I, I'm interested in and I wouldn't mind exploring uh, further in this podcast. And I, and I have a little bit and I, I likely will more. So moving on to point six, he says, quote, throughout the book, sometimes explicit, sometimes implicit, runs a devotion to Western civilization and an awareness of the necessity of defending it against the messianic world-conquering intentions of communism. Whether, again, our heritage is valued primarily because it is our tradition or because it is envisioned as a matrix of freedom unparalleled in historical experience, there is here no hint of that scorn for one's own, taking the form of a vague internationalism which characterizes the liberal outlook and which has paralyzed our resistance to communist aggression these past decades. End quote. So that's you know, it's pretty basic. That's an, an ad, a love for Western civilization and adherence to one's own civilization rather than a, a civilizational self-loathing or a civilizational a drive toward civilizational suicide that infuses much of liberal thought back then and today, I would say, even more so. So those are the, those are the six characteristics uh, of, of conservatism. And you'll notice that although the last one may hit on this a little bit, None of those points could in any way be said to be nationalist. Um, they, they talk about man's society to the state and the ordering of societies, but they don't talk about the necessity of the distinction of one society from its neighboring societies or one nation from its neighboring nations. That is somewhat taken as a given, although there's an opposition to internationalism, there you know, mentioned in the last one, it's not quite as clear as maybe the modern push toward nationalism. So in some ways that might be, um, might be a weakness in this older conservatism that it just sort of took for granted uh, the nationalist sentiments that embodied the Republican Party perhaps, you know, 30, 40, 50 years prior to the writing of this book. But over time, the internationalist sentiments and the and the the um, particularly the libertarian influences as, as regard like free trade and immigration and other things that started to infuse the conservative movement to some extent began to began to weaken the conservative dedication to nationalism. And of course, on the liberal side, the nationalism was seen and still is seen as this as as a deeply negative phenomenon. So eventually, you know, now in the modern era, that kind of moves back to the forefront as people begin to see the consequences of having a disdain for the nation state and an adherence to the superiority of a global order. So anyway, that's enough out of that essay. Um, I'm going to jump at this point to one of the early essays, and this one is uh, is by Russell Kirk, and he's talking, this essay is called Prescription, Authority, and Ordered Freedom, and he's essentially talking about tradition. Russell Kirk is very much on the traditionalist side of the equation, and so he talks about the concepts of social norms, prescription, authority, and I think it's important just to mention that, you know, at one point in time, it was very much conceived that the conservative was dedicated to the principle of authority. And very much, um, a, a lot of conservatism nowadays is really based on anti-authoritarianism. The idea that authority is is fundamentally unjust, but it's not always cohesive. Some activities like like the, the requirement that you wear a mask is like tyranny. That's, that's, you know, that's an authority that people aren't willing to subscribe to. But like the idea that you've got to – like women have to wear a shirt in public. They can't go around with their titties hanging out. Like that's – oh, that's a legitimate use of authority because it's, you know, it's protecting us against moral decay, if you will. Uh, but to protect us against um, you know, a, a, a pandemic, that's not legitimate. And that sort of – 
odd relationship with authority where sometimes it's okay, particularly when it when it relates to controlling the morals of the society, then authority is okay. But in in like protecting people from threats, it, sometimes like, oh, everybody's on their own. There should be no authority. We, you know, that's nanny state, so on and so forth. So there's a, there's a funny relationship with authority, but I think that there has to be a recognition of the existence of authority within a society in order for a society to function. So anyway, um, he, uh, Russell Kirk talks a little bit about that, not a tremendous amount, but I want to read a few parts of this um, because I'm really like interested in the explanation of what tradition is and why it's important. So in this, in this section, he says, quote, Prescription, socially and politically speaking, means those ways and institutions and rights prescribed by long, sometimes immemorial, usage. Tradition, a word until the end of the 18th century applied almost exclusively to Christian beliefs not set down in scripture, means received opinions, convictions religious and moral and political and aesthetic, passed down from generation to generation, so that they are accepted by most men as a matter of course. I have discussed the nature of tradition and prescription at some length in my book Beyond the Dreams of Avarice. Fulbert of Chartres and Gerbert of Rheims, those two grand schoolmen, said that we moderns are dwarfs standing upon the shoulders of giants. We see so far only because we are elevated upon the accomplishment of our ancestors. And if we break with ancestral wisdom, we at once are plunged into the ditch of ignorance. All that we have and know is founded upon the experience of the nation. As Burke put it, the individual is foolish, but the species is wise. Men have no right, Burke said, to risk the very existence of their nation and their civilization upon experiments in morals and politics. For each man's private capital of intelligence is petty. It is only when a man draws upon the bank and capital of the ages, the wisdom of our ancestors, that he can act wisely. Without resort to tradition and prescription, we are left with merely our vanity and the brief and partial experience of our evanescent lives. What shadows we are and what shadows we pursue. G. K. Chesterton expressed much the same truth when he wrote of the democracy of the dead. When we decide great questions in our time, he held, we ought to count not merely the votes of our contemporaries, but the opinions of many generations of men, and particularly the convictions of the wise men who have preceded us in time. By trial and error, by revelation, by the insights of men of genius, Mankind has acquired, slowly and painfully, over thousands of years, a knowledge of human nature and of the civil social order which no individual possibly can supplant by private rationality. This is true especially in matters of morals, politics, and taste. But in considerable degree it is also true even in modern science and technology. Once a student objected to me that Surely, enlightened modern man could work out rationally a much better system of morals and politics than the hodgepodge we have inherited from blundering ancestors. But I asked this student if, without consulting senior technicians, books, and authority generally, he thought he could construct, unaided, an automobile. If, indeed, he thought that he, personally, even with all sorts of advice, could make an automobile at all. He confessed that he could not and it began to be borne in upon him to construct carte blanche, a system of morals and politics that really would work, might be an undertaking more difficult still. So even the most gifted of men, and always the great mass of human beings, must fall back upon tradition and prescription if they are to act at all in this world. At the very least, it saves a great deal of time. It is conceivable that if I set myself to it, I might calculate for myself the circumference of the earth quite independently of previous calculations. But since I have no strong mathematical gifts, it is improbable that my calculations would be more accurate than those of the present authorities. 
and it seems almost certain that my result would be quite the same as the present calculation of the Earth's circumference. So I would have spent months or years of a brief life in trying to gain what I could have had for the asking. If we are to accomplish anything in this life, we must take much for granted. As Newman said, if one had to make the choice, it would be better to believe all things than to doubt all things. In the matter of the Earth's circumference, nearly all of us are much better off if we simply accept the traditional or authoritative calculation. This is even more true of moral and social first principles. Only through prescription and tradition, only by habitual acceptance of just and sound authority, can men acquire knowledge of the norms for humanity. Authority tells us that murder is wrong. Prescription immemorially has visited severe punishments upon murderers. Tradition presents us with an ancient complex of tales of the evil consequences of murder. Now, a man who thinks his private petty rationality superior to the wisdom of our ancestors may undertake experiments in murder with a view to testing these old irrational scruples. But the results of such experiments are sure to be disagreeable for everyone concerned, including the researcher. And that experimenter has no right to be surprised if we hang him by the neck until he is quite dead. For if men flout norm and convention, life becomes intolerable. It is through respect for tradition and prescription and recourse to those sources of knowledge that the great mass of men acquire a tolerable understanding of norms and conventions, of the rules by which private and social existence is made tolerable. End quote. So essentially that's a rehashing of the necessity of tradition and the fact that tradition is the accumulated wisdom of generations and generations of people, each of whom have been gently adjusting tradition to allow their own experiences to play a role in the tradition, but not dismantling it with the sort of hubris or arrogance that would be required to believe that one man or a council of men or even one entire generation has sufficient rational capacities or sufficient wisdom to simply unmake everything that has been made by all previous generations and remake something new, presumably better. It just takes a certain degree of arrogance to believe that that's even possible. It, would, it requires you to believe that all the people who have come before us were fundamentally flawed individuals, and yet somehow we are above those flaws. That somehow we have the capacity to fix all of the evils and wrongs that have been committed all throughout the past. There, there's a sort of humility that has to happen when we approach reform or we approach, um, you know, trying to build new institutions or trying to uh, eliminate old institutions that haven't served us well. All things being equal, there must be an adherence to traditions based on our own sense of humility and recognition that there have, there have been generations of wisdom put into the traditions, and even though you may not understand the traditions, doesn't mean that the traditions are themselves arbitrary. It just may be that you don't have the capacity to understand it because it is the accumulated wisdom of many, many people. So that's the essential point that he's making there, and I, I think it's so important that we understand that when we, when we approach civilization and traditions and norms of social behavior. So, uh, moving on to another section from this particular essay, uh, he says, quote, A government should accord with the traditions and the prescriptive ways of a people. This is the view of Montesquieu and of Burke. A good government is no artificial contrivance, no invention of coffeehouse philosophers got up upon a priori abstractions to suit the intellectual mood of an hour, Governments hastily designed upon theories of pure reason ordinarily are wretched dominations. The longest lived of these poor governments has been that of modern France, which never has recovered from the hacking and chopping that the constitution of French society received at the hands of rigid metaphysicians from 1789 onward. 
much more evanescent because they had a smaller reservoir of tradition to exhaust were the artificial governments set up in Central and Southern Europe after the First World War. Now, the good government, very different from these, is the growth of centuries of social experience. It has been called organic. I prefer the analogy spiritual. Trusting to the wisdom of our ancestors and the experience of the nation, it puts its faith in precedent, prescription, historical trial and error, and consensus of opinion over the generations. Not infatuated with neatness, it prefers the strength and majesty of the Gothic style. The government of Britain, because of its age and success, is our best example of this type, and the government of the United States is nearly as good an instance of the triumph of this principle, that society is an august continuity in essence, held together by veneration, prescription, and tradition. Nominally, of course, we Americans created our federal constitution by deliberate action within the space of a few months, but in actuality, that formal constitution and our state constitutions chiefly put down on paper what already existed and was accepted in public opinion, beliefs and institutions long established in the colonies and drawn from centuries of English experience with parliaments, the common law, and the balancing of orders and interests in a realm. Respect for precedent and prescription governed the minds of the founders of the Republic. We appealed to the prescriptive liberties of Englishmen, not to liberty, egality, fraternity, and the philosophical and moral structure of our civil order was rooted in the Christian faith, not in the worship of reason. The success of the American and British governments, I am suggesting, is produced by their preference for growth, experience, tradition, and prescription over a closet metaphysician's grand design. The great lessons of politics are taught a people through their historical experience. No nation can sever itself from its past and still prosper, for the dead alone give us energy. And whatever constitution has been long accepted in a nation, that constitution, amended perhaps, but essentially the same, is as good as a people can expect. True, that constitution may be improved or restored, but if it is discarded altogether like waste paper, every order in society suffers terribly. The American and British constitutions have worked well, but being living essences, they cannot easily be transplanted to other states. One of the cardinal errors of the French revolutionaries was their endeavor to remake France upon the model of what they thought English politics to be. Though any people have something to learn from the experiences of any other, still there exists no single constitution calculated to work successfully everywhere. For the political institutions of a people grow out of their religion, their moral habits, their economy, even their literature. Political institutions are but part of an intricate structure of civilization, the roots of which go infinitely deep. Attempts to impose borrowed institutions upon an alien culture generally are disastrous, though some decades or even generations may be required for the experiment to run its unlucky course. Randolph of Roanoke, in opposing Clay's design, for encouraging revolutions upon the American pattern, cried out in his sardonic way, You can no more make liberty out of Spanish matter than you can make a frigate out of a bundle of pine saplings. Though this is somewhat hard upon the Spaniards, it remains true that parliamentary government, Anglo-American style, rarely has been secure in Spanish lands. Spaniards' liberty, when they enjoy it, is secured by different institutions and customs. Yet still, our political theory and our foreign policy are plagued by the delusion that some domination of American constitutions and manners will be established universally. The American liberals' conviction in Santayana's sentence that the nun must not remain a nun and China shall not keep its wall. This fond hope never will be realized. For individuals, as Chesterton said, are happy only when they are their own petty little selves, and this is as true of nations. 
to impose the American Constitution upon all the world would not render all the world happy. To the contrary, our Constitution would work in few lands and would make many men miserable in short order. States, like men, must find their own paths to order and justice and freedom. And usually those paths are ancient and winding ways, and their signposts are authority, tradition, prescription. Without the legal institutions rooted in common and Roman law from which it arose, the American constitutional system would be unworkable. Well, take up this constitutional system abstractly and set it down as an exotic plant in Persia or Guinea or the Congo, where the common law, English style, and the Roman law are unknown, and where the bed of justice rests upon the Quran or upon hereditary chieftainship, why, the thing cannot succeed. Such an undertaking may disrupt the old system of justice and may even supplant it for a time, but in the long run, the traditional morals, habits, and establishments of a people, confirmed by their historical experience, will reassert themselves, and the innovation will be undone if that culture is to survive at all. End quote. So, uh, that's a section that I really like where he talks essentially about the incompatibility of one people's system, one people's constitutional system or governmental system upon another, or the idea that American liberal democracy can and should be imposed across the world, that every nation, every people is somehow going to benefit if we can bring about democracy. And you can see this sort of thing in places like Iraq, or we're going to, we're going to set up this democracy or, or Libya or whatever foreign land it might be where we think we're going to go and we're going to displace the system they have, the system they have of a, of a strong man leader, or a dictatorial leader, whatever it may be, that we'll look on some foreign country and we'll say, well, that's not liberal democracy. And those people would be so much happier if we were to impose our system upon them, if we were to impose democracy and liberal norms, and you know, if we were to eliminate whatever social norms they have that might seem distasteful to us. And it doesn't ever work because... Because a political system should grow organically out of the traditions of a people. And our traditions have grown up to become the American Constitution. That's the government that we've acquired through the process that we've gone through of, you know, this works, this doesn't work, this accords with our, with our temperament, that doesn't. And so this is the system that we decided that we have, we like looking upon our ancestors or the ancestors of other nations that we have found benefit from. But, it's something that happens organically, and it's not going to be the same for every country. And so the, that's that's an effect of the liberal universalism. That's and and you know I say liberal. It's it applies to a lot of conservatives as as well. If you look at like George Bush and his crusade to spread democracy across the world, it's the exact same premise. Um, and a true traditionalist conservative is going to understand that every people has their own ways and their own systems of authority and their own systems of decision making and their own systems of organizing their society and their families and everything else. And all of that is much better and more productive and more peaceful and more just when it's allowed to develop on its own without the external um, meddling of foreign powers. So that's kind of the point that he makes there. Those were the two sections I wanted to read from Russell Kirk. Uh, And then... This will probably be one of my longer essay, longer episodes because I do have actually two more essays that I want to get to. Uh, so let's see which one I'm going to tackle first here. Uh, I suppose it will it will be this section here and from an essay called "The Conservative." St- I'm sorry, "The Convenient State." This is called "The Convenient State," and this essay is by Gary Wills. And in this essay, he kind of sets two governmental orders against each other and compares and contrasts the two of them. So on the one hand, you have the order of justice, and on the other hand, you have the order of convenience. And uh, the order of justice essentially is the notion that the role of government is is to implement justice, to determine what justice is, and then see to it that justice is served throughout the body of the people. And this is 
essentially a, an ideological position, like I was talking about the imposition of, of an ideological system from the top down, where a certain group of ru a ruling class of individuals determines the, the way that society is supposed to be and then attempts to impose it from the top down. So this is... He, he describes the two. He talks about the order of justice um, and the and the damage that it can do to a people. And I'm not going to read from the section where he talks about the order of justice. Suffice to say that it's basically the the imposition of an ideology from the top down. I want to talk more about the section where he talks about the order of convenience. He actually says that uh, the use of the word convenience is not really um, the best term. He says it's susceptible to misunderstanding. He it seems as though he didn't quite know what else to call it. He said there's no good word for it. If if I was writing this essay, uh, I would have called it the pragmatic order because it seems like that's more what he's describing is the idea that the the state serves the real goals of a people um, and their prosperity and their well-being and their flourishing and kind of like Aristotle claiming that the end of life is eudaimonia or flourishing or happiness that the state essentially exists to serve the eudaimonia of a people um, the flourishing and success of the nation of which it is the governing body as opposed to an order of justice. And even among many conservatives who would say that the purpose of the state is to secure the liberty of the people, um, of the individuals who make up the citizens of that, of that state, even that could be considered a sort of um, order of justice because here is, the, here is the definition of liberty and here is what the government is going to do explicitly to enforce this system of liberty among its people. Um, even that, I think, would not adequately be described as the order of convenience or the pragmatic order, if as I would have it. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit, well, I'm going to read this section here and then talk briefly about what he has to say about the order of convenience. So he says, quote, The order of convenience must be built on a basic truth that is scandalous to modern ears. The particular aim of the state is not to achieve justice, and certainly not to dispense it. In the words of Newman, satisfaction, peace, liberty, conservative interests are the supreme end of the law, not mere raw justice as such. This, of course, does not mean that the state is to be unjust or free of the imperatives of the moral law. The state, like the family, like the corporation, like the labor union, is bound by the laws of morality that are incumbent on all human endeavor, corporate as well as individual. In carrying out its function, the state must act with justice. But its specific aim is not to enforce justice as such. The family, too, must observe right order, the child obeying, the parent avoiding undue laxity or severity, husband and wife helping each other, yet observing measure in their demands upon each other. This due measure, this order of right, is achieved by the observance of justice. Yet the formal aim of the family is not sheer justice as such. Its aim is to give birth and education to new members of our nation, to recruit partners in the human adventure. Only when this purpose is clearly understood can the order of claims and the area of just activity be discerned in the life of the family. In the same way, the state must observe justice in its activities, but its aim is more limited, more concretely specified, and unless that aim is made clear, there is no way of knowing what justice is for the state. Politics becomes an instrument for seeking every kind of good thing, for bringing ideal justice itself down to earth. We have seen the theocratic consequences of such an undertaking. He then goes on to say, quote, If the state is not to be founded on an ideal order of justice, what is its basis? Obviously, the real order, the order of man's needs. The individual only finds his natural fulfillment in society. As Aristotle pointed out, even language is a convention, a coming together. Language is itself society. 
and all man's other achievements involve a similar social opportunity for the individual's self-expression. But if there is a society, there must be a state. As a necessary physical regimen keeps the individual alive, so there must be a regime, an order, a discipline in society. That regime is the state. The fallacy of the rationalists is that they begin the construction of their political models with the isolated reason of the individual. They make the pure autonomy of the individual clash and finally merge with the autonomy of a just order. But man does not start with a formed and pure freedom. Man free of society is man free of air, free, that is, to suffocate. The rationalist pits the individual against an abstract order of justice in the state. Instead of tracing the spontaneous growth and grouping of social forms that give the individual a field for expression and activity. The state appears apocalyptically in such theories, bringing justice newborn into prior chaos, but in the real order, the state arises from a hierarchy of social organizations, of groups formed to fill particular needs. The state stabilizes this spontaneous social expression. It answers a natural demand for unity. It cannot initiate such unity or carve countries out of the map by legislative fiat. Although it is a commonplace that man is a social animal, the rationalist theories contradict this commonplace. For if the state arises out of man's social instinct, then the state destroys its own roots when it denies free scope to the other forms of social life. The state, when it is made the source of justice, must be equally and instantly available to all citizens, and in achieving this, in sweeping away the confusion of claims raised by families, economic orders, educational conventions, codes of conduct, natural gradations of privilege, the liberal leaves society atomized, each man isolated, with all the weight of political power coming unintercepted upon him. The higher forms of organization do not grow out of and strengthen the lower, but counter and erase them. This is what happened under the order of justice, from the time when Plato pitted the state against the family to the modern breakdown of divided jurisdiction in the centralized state. He then goes on to say, quote, For the realist, on the other hand, the state, by disciplining a particular society, expresses the character of that society, protects its spontaneity and symbolic self-confrontation at all levels of life, draws on the society's specific resources, and commands a loyalty that is personalized as patriotism. How does the state accomplish this? How complement the multiple spontaneous or consanguineous forms of social coherence? as all things complement, by supplying what is lacking. Other social groups than the political have a positive bond of mutual affection, or defined and positive interest. This is their strength, but it circumscribes their appeal. Only those qualified to take part who share the interests of a family or a class, of a school of thought or a creed. But conflicts of interest arise in the common area of life in which these activities take place. The task of adjudicating these conflicts by a shared code and of including all the strata of society in a single frame of minimal order must be entrusted to an agent of order with force at its disposal. This agency circumscribes a larger community than the partial groupings. It is not voluntary from moment to moment. It can enforce its judgments in the name of the very social forces that become obstreperous. The state is necessary because the other overlapping social forms extend across a field of human activity that no one of them can circumscribe. Thus, the end of the state is the orderly advancement and discipline of society as the necessary ground of human activity and the necessary basic condition for the formation of a state is a shared good 
that must be protected if all social and individual effort is to thrive. End quote. Okay, so uh, this convenient state essentially exists to adjudicate between conflicts of interest between smaller entities so that all these smaller social entities from families to labor unions to corporations to everything else uh, they spring up organically through the interaction of people in a society but in order to manage the uh, interact these interactions between these groups the state exists only he says uh, he says He says the task of adjudicating these conflicts by a shared code and of including all the strata of society in a single frame of minimal order must be entrusted to an agent of order with force at its disposal. And so it really d is designed to uh, balance the interests of these competing entities within a society and also uh, to express the character of of a society, protect its spontaneity and symbolic self-confrontation, drawing on the society's specific resources and commanding a loyalty personalized as patriotism. Essentially, only those functions that cannot be accomplished by lower levels of social organization. And so I think I'm going to leave that at that, uh, but I think it's just really important and interesting. Again, the same concept that this that the state evolves organically out of lower levels and so it reflects the particular character of a people and the last section that i want to read the last essay uh, is called reason and the restoration of tradition and this is by stanley perry and this is a really good essay uh, he talks about uh, the basis for uh, morality within a society and the uh, breakdown of moral communication without when a society does not have a coherent adherence to a singular tradition that can lay out the moral basis for the existence of the society. Um, there's a lot to it. He talks about religion. He essentially says that this basic tradition that provides the, the, the fundamental framework for moral understanding uh, between the members of a society, it, it must be in some way religious. And I think that's an interesting concept, obviously, given the nature of, of my position in this podcast, that that be addressed. Is it accurate? And if it is accurate, how do we deal with it? So in this section, uh, in this essay, he says, he says, quote, the radical inability of reason to solve the problem of a crisis in civilization rests essentially on the fact that in all moral reason there is a necessary element of subjectivity. As a result of this element, the methods of persuasion, the only ones available to reason, collapse with the disappearance of the social preconditions necessary for the process of persuasion. Since the basic precondition is a commonly accepted moral order, it follows almost by definition that in a collapse of tradition, in essence of a commonly accepted moral order, reason becomes helpless. This is essentially the argument against the appeal to reason, even as it is made by the right. As it stands, however, it needs a great deal of elaboration before its validity becomes apparent. The elaboration must begin with a new appreciation of the subjective element in moral reason. The ancients were fully aware of this factor in reason and of its strategic position vis-à-vis -vis the problem of social order. But in modern times, this appreciation has been lost. The basic confusion begins with the rationalistic identification of reason with specul speculative reason alone. In moral theory, this led to the discarding of moral judgments, as men usually make them, as pure pre-rational preferences without foundation in objective reality. Thereupon, the problem of moral truth became a problem of discovering the scientific methods whereby truly objective knowledge about man could be gained. The ideal was to formulate moral principles 
apart from the insights of moral man. He goes on to say, quote, The idea that moral knowledge has a subjective element derives from the fact that the knowing subject is himself part of the moral object known at the moment of moral judgment. Because of this, the condition of the knower deeply affects the content of the moral judgment made. Judgment about right action is not rooted in knowledge about some abstract nature of man. At the moment of judgment, it is a judgment about the concrete nature of the one making it. The concrete nature, moreover, is not some static, unchanging object of knowledge. It is a dynamic locus of intelligible necessity, whose tendencies have already been extensively developed or distorted by the entire prior life of the agent. The radical consequence of this condition is that for every man, the objective moral order available for his judgment is one which he himself has helped to build. Every man has formed the primitive nature originally his into something in accord with or against the inner tendencies of that nature. And what is there is truly there, whether it is good or evil, and whatever is there is the only reality available when a moral judgment is to be made. In the inner moral world, man can construct realities that are not morally true. Thus, moral knowledge is acquired by a moral agent whose act affects his ability to know rightly, because his every act specifies the nature in and through which he perceives reality. He then goes on to say, quote, If two men with notably different moral natures discuss a moral point, not much progress is made. They are reasoning from two different realities. Consequently, for each, the arguments of the other are unreal. When this is not recognized, each can only think that the other really sees the truth of the argument but refuses to admit it. This condition can be generalized. Between a good man and an evil man, or between men evil in different ways, no communication can exist in the moral order. Since each, since each lives in his own reality, each can find in it the evidence only for his own ideas. Thus, no argument based on another reality can possibly have any persuasiveness. Aristotle saw quite clearly that this quality of moral reason has major implications for social order. He saw that the process of persuasion can work perfectly only in a society of serious, mature people. In proportion as men are imperfect, they multiply exclusive realities for themselves. And common action derives more and more from force, the necessary substitute for persuasion when order is essential. In like manner, basic differences in conviction about justice are traced to prior differences in the way men understand their own natures in essence, what they have made of themselves. Plato, too, saw the impossibility of communication between good and deformed men. The people of the cave will always kill the philosopher king because he questions the order which they know to be true. This, of course, does not hold for speculative reason, where the perception of truth is not tied into the moral condition of the knower as object, here, communication is always possible, but speculative reason cannot deliver moral truth. Only moral reason can do that. And the necessary subjectivity of moral reason blocks the communication between moral reasons rooted in different moral realities. From this blocking of effective communication, there follows a pragmatic equality of moral judgment. The equality is, of course, entirely pragmatic. For moral judgment can be tested for truth, and true judgments are superior to false ones. But this does not change the effective practical consequence that every man must hold his judgment to be equal to, in essence, as good as every other man's, for each has access only to the reality of his own moral world, which, since it is the only reality he knows, must be treated as exclusively real. Judgments rooted in it can be compared to one another for truth as against the reality, and so among men who know or live in the same moral world, a structuring of men as superior or inferior is possible. 
This is true also among men whose moral world is evil in the same way, but in practice and for purposes of social action, no comparisons are possible between judgments rooted in different moral worlds. In all this, of course, the case of a man acting against his own moral judgment is a special case. Thus, we have come to one of the basic limits on moral reason. It cannot communicate with another moral reason that differs radically from it. End quote. Essentially, he's talking about the subjectivity of moral reason, that each person uh, is going to understand moral reason in their own manner based upon their experiences in life. And so the capacity for communication between people with fundamentally different moral systems uh, is severely inhibited. And so the, the, the essence that he's going to get to here uh, in this next section... Uh, will kind of bring this home for us. So here uh, he says, quote, Moral life can be lived only within the confines of an ordered society. More than this, an ordered society, a civilization having a common tradition, is in its basic significance nothing more than the organized moral life of the members. Our vast technology the massiveness of our science and the grotesque consequences of its practical applications conceal the essentially human and therefore moral nature of a civilization from us. We can, from this point of view, define a civilization as a system of intersubjective relations among the members of a multitude. Here, one is tempted to cite the famous passage of Burke to the effect that society is a partnership in all of life. For if we examine any civilization in its period of health, we find it to be rooted in a shared view of man's meaning and destiny. We find basic to it expectations of how men behave, agreements about the noble and ignoble, consensus about justice. In other words, in all these elements which have an essentially subjective dimension in their perception, we find agreement, communication, discourse. We find debate also, it is true, and disagreement about specific interpretations of principle. And any society will have its loose ends. Those who live outside the walls while remaining in the city, these peripheral events are irrelevant. The essential thing is that civilization is a system based on the communication of inner perceptions of the truth about man. Thus, a common tradition enables men who differ widely as to actual moral achievement to live a life in common. The shared principles structure the community. The structuring is publicly organized and normally is established by processes whose sanction lies in the fact that they do implement the view of the good held to be true by all. We can say in brief, that a civilization exists in the first instance when a multitude of natures are open to each other for communication on the level of moral perception. Where natures are closed to each other, there is no civilization. It has fallen out of existence. Even though the massive exoskeleton of buildings and technology still exists, a tradition exists as the ordering principle of multitude precisely when it exists in the soul of each member and constitutes thereby the opening from each to every other soul. If there is no opening, there is no tradition, even though the symbols of the tradition continue to exist and receive a formalized recognition. This communication of moral truth through a common tradition does not meet the difficulty raised above in the case of moral reason, for a tradition is not rooted in rational speculation concerning the nature of men. Here again, rationalistic speculation about the irrational in society requires a caution. Tradition constitutes the truth that the members of a society hold about man, God, and the world. It is held in a rational way, and many members of the society spend their lives analyzing that truth 
in the process constructing impressive philosophical and theological systems. Within the tradition, reason roams the avenues of speculation freely and with fruitful results. But the organizing principle of the tradition, its root perception, is held by way of belief, of faith, rather than by way of a ratiocinative establishment of truth. Vogelin calls this the original compact experience that constitutes a people in the first instance, and is the element of unity during the entire history of that people. It is a common sharing in this compact experience that opens the members to one another. The structuring of the society results to the degree to which the members experience this organizing belief, so that men can persuade one another concerning good and evil by argumentation which presupposes and relates to the compact experience. We are not concerned here to prove that this is so. For this we, for this we rely on the extensive work of men like Vogelin, Eliad, Wilson, Frankfurt, and others. We are concerned here to identify as precisely as possible the relation between compact experience, unfolding tradition, and communication. If we examine the compact experience, we find that it is, in its essential nature, a religious experience. Men hold it as a revelation about the truth, not as a discovery of truth in the rational sense of that term. The work of Vogelin on the concept of compact experience constitutes an interesting specification of the more general observation of Dawson that every great civilization is based on a religion. Further work on the history of religion has uncovered a vast quantity of information about the nature of this original and, we might say, constitutive compact experience. Certainly the appearance of the religious mind does not of itself constitute the emergence of civilization. Neolithic man was also religious. Here we are in the area of unproven speculation, but one can surmise that the religion of Neolithic man was a part of his general movement within the rhythms of nature, and one might also surmise from the documents available that the characteristic religious experience that founds civilization occurs when men, in the presence of threats from nature, seek more active cooperation with the transcendent. Men then see things in terms of transcendent intention of beginning and end, and therefore in terms of meaning and purpose in human life. Within this context, they can then do something about salvation, whatever that may mean to a particular people. We have here the foundation of any true idea of freedom, man's power to contribute to the divine purpose of his existence, man's power to cooperate with the divine. Thus, the motivating experience contains, in germ, all the moral views that will develop as the civilization grows. Within the civilization, moral discourse on any level will be persuasive in proportion as it relates itself to an application of this generally accepted compact experience. With regard to the moral nature of man, the truth about man is held as a truth about the divine purpose in making man. Here again a distinction must be made. Human nature is certainly knowable by moral reason. In a healthy society, moral reason can discover a great deal of natural law from rational reflection. In principle, we can admit that this kind of knowledge is possible even in the context of a disrupted tradition. The point is that in the latter case, the one at issue, such knowledge is not communicable. At least it cannot be the basis for the re-establishment of tradition. The point could be argued simply on the basis that a tradition is not constituted by this type of knowledge in the first place, but this would neglect the point of the radical inability of moral reason because of its nature to establish such a reconstruction. The compact experience, in contrast to the concepts of moral reason, is communicable precisely because it is not rooted in persuasive rational argument. Its sanction is not derived from the reasonableness of its explanation, but from its origin in a revealing divinity. The truth presented demands assent precisely because it is divine. An assent is reasonable 
once such truth is seen in its origins, because such truth is self-validating. The persuasion here is both complex and simple. It is complex because it involves not only a content of truth, but more deeply an experience of personal helplessness before threat of such nature as to induce a sense of the need for salvation. But the persuasion is also simple, for it appeals to experience rather than prior premises, and it offers a clear resolution of the problem on which it is based, a resolution that can be simple or highly elaborate depending on the capacity of the individual. There is no need for persuasion concerning the truths of the specific element of the resolution. By their nature, these are mysterious and can be expressed only in symbols and myths. It is necessary only that the religious worldview be coherent as a whole. I believe so that I may understand is the only possible response to this body of explanation in any civilization. The motivating compact experience, then, is the root of tradition. Through it, the tradition communicates itself by authoritative means. It depends, however, not on the authority of reason, but on the authority of the superior source of its truth. On the psychological level, this superior source is valid as long as the individual experiences the basic need to which the compact experience arises as a resolution. Every civilization has, as its normal basic process, an educational system ordered to communicating this tradition in its authoritative form. Formal education in the truth is but one aspect of the process. The liturgical life of the community involves, in the healthy period of the civilization, a symbolic reliving of the motivating compact experience. This massive acceptance of the tradition by the people and its status as a public order constitute an educative force for each member so the truth of the society forms the inner life of its members. The process seems so self-contained that one wonders how it could ever falter, but we know that it does falter, and when it does, the civilization experiences a basic crisis in its existence. If we examine this crisis from the point of view of common life and the communication it presupposes, we find that basically the souls of the individual members close up and lose contact with one another. The idea may seem melodramatic, but this is the phenomenon already extensively analyzed in our own crisis. End quote. So that is probably a, a unnecessarily involved way of saying that at the core of, of uh, moral sense of the members of a civilization is a belief that is not built through moral reasoning or any sort of rational process, but is a belief in the fundamental moral code that is religious or divine or revelatory in nature, and as, as such doesn't need to be explained, just becomes accepted. And by people sharing acceptance of the, this fundamental basis of tradition and basis of moral understanding, they're then able to communicate with each other the nuances and the details and use their moral reasoning to kind of engage in this dialectic process of, you know, is this in accord with the fundamental tradition? Is that in accord or what have you? But once that that fundamental uh, nugget of moral understanding that comes through that um, divine source is missing, then the capacity of the members of a civilization to form a coherent sense of um, morality is impeded, and people aren't able to communicate their morality with one another because they lack that basis upon which moral understanding rests. Now, if you've been listening to the podcast, you know that I take a very um, uh, naturalistic, secular view of reality. Now, if you have a society that has, is built on this sort of um, religious experience, and then you come to find that some of the fundamental claims of the doctrine that's associated with this religious experience turns out to not be accurate, 
how much of that tradition can you maintain, if any of it, and can you maintain a, a shared moral understanding in a situation in which the religious foundation as such is unable to be maintained because the process of rational inquiry has undermined it to a degree where it it's no longer able to simply be accepted on faith. Is it possible to take a civilization and rebuild a new shared moral understanding to replace the old shared moral understanding without simultaneously annihilating that civilization through the process of searching for those moral foundations that different people are going to find in different ways. Without that core shared moral understanding, is civilization even possible? It's a really important question for us in the modern world. And the sort of question that I'm trying to explore bit by bit through these books. And another thing that I want to point out about that last section before I go is that essentially he says that he doesn't say that this has to be Christian. He simply says that it has to be transcendent. And so that all of the civilizations throughout history that have had this transcendent basis, most of them uh, were not Christian civilizations. And so it, it, it becomes the case that if you're a Christian, you're going to look at all these other Hinduism or whatever it may be, the, the Greek paganism or, or whatever, these different, um, these different revelatory foundations of these civilizations are all going to be understood as false, right? If you're a Christian, you're going to understand Hinduism as false, the Greek paganism as false. And so he's basically saying that it's not necessary that the doctrine be true, simply that it be believed, right? Because he's obviously, if he's a Christian, which I understand him to be from reading, you know, other parts of the essay that I didn't read out loud, he understands that the religious nature of the basis of other civilizations, non-Christian civilizations, still exists and still serves that role, despite the fact of its falsity. So then... You know, do we need to understand, some, do we need to believe in something that we know cognitively to not be true? Is it, do we, do we need, to me that doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense. So can we build some sort of transcendent understanding in a world that lacks any transcendent quality? Or can we find a transcendent quality in a naturalistic secular world? Again, important questions for our, the capacity of our civilization to cohere into the future. And I'm going to leave it at that. This is obviously one of my longer episodes. I hope you stuck through the whole way and uh, come back next time for more goodness. Bye.